Hello, everybody. My name is Debbie Lynn Toomey, and you're watching Health Links Aging Strong, which is an injury prevention outreach program that aims to share information and also resources that can empower older adults. And this program, Aging Strong, is sponsored by the Quincy Health Department. And uh, the topic today is on Memory Cafe. The guest that I will be uh, introducing to you, her name is Beth Salzberg. And uh, just before she um, starts talking, I want to give her a proper introduction. And I know she'll explain more about her role is because it's very impressive. Uh, Beth is the director of the Alzheimer's Related Disorders uh, at the Family Support Program at the Jewish Family and Children's Services in Waltham, Massachusetts. So... Beth, welcome. Thank you so much, Debbie Lynn. I'm very delighted to be here and I appreciate Tufts Medical Center for the invitation. Love talking about memory cafes. What I'm planning to do is to um, spend the next 20, 25 minutes going through some information about um, dementia, how it affects people and really emphasizing living well with dementia, which is our goal. And then we're going to talk about what a memory cafe is. I know it's something that a lot of people have never heard of. And so there's always a question, what is it? What do you do there? So we're going to talk a little bit about what it's for, what actually happens when you attend one, and then where you can find a memory cafe. At that point, I'm going to pause and I would love to hear from you. So if anyone has questions or comments, or Debbie, if you have questions on behalf of your audience, I would be delighted to um, have a little bit more of a conversation. So with that, I just want to tell you a bit more about myself. I work at Jewish Family and Children's Service, which is in Waltham, and I wear a lot of hats, but everything I do is working with individuals and families and communities around the topic of dementia and other cognitive changes. So I coordinate the JFNCS Memory Cafe, which has been running since 2014. It was the second Memory Cafe in Massachusetts. And I also run a network called the JFNCS Memory Cafe Percolator, which helps organizations throughout Massachusetts and across the country, and even in some other countries, to start and run their own memory cafes. I also am the lead for a public awareness program called Dementia Friends for the state of Massachusetts, and you might see behind me some of our um, posters. And finally, I'm part of the leadership team for the Dementia Friendly Massachusetts Initiative. So I do a lot of things, but they all relate to this very challenging, growing issue of living with dementia. So um, let's just start at the beginning and take a brief moment to explain what this term is, dementia. People use the term a lot, but we don't always have a shared understanding of what it actually means. Dementia is an umbrella term, so it, it um, covers a whole bunch of different symptoms, including loss of memory, but also changes in other thinking skills, such as the ability to make plans and solve problems. Um, sometimes it affects people's personality. It can affect their ability to kind of filter their behavior to fit the situation. It can involve um, sometimes um, changes in perception, hallucinations, sleep disorders, a lot of other impacts that are severe enough that they affect a person's daily life. So that's kind of the group of symptoms, but then it can be caused by a whole number of different medical conditions. Alzheimer's disease is the most common, so that's the one you see listed on top. Vascular dementia is very common as well. And in fact, a lot of people have both Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. And then there are many others, including dementia with Lewy bodies, frontotemporal degeneration, and the list goes on. This is a graphic from the Alzheimer's Association, which I think is helpful just to give us that common language. 
I want to mention that cognitive changes may not be due to dementia. They can be um, because it's it can it can be other factors. Um, you know, sometimes people get nervous about this, but um, it's normal to have a harder time remembering things as you get older. Can you just explain to us a little bit more about the vascular um, dementia? Is that more from a stroke or um, what is that about? Yes. Yeah, so um, dementia that's caused by vascular disease, it can take the form of strokes. And each of these different conditions has different kinds of side effects um, that go with it. So for example, if someone has vascular dementia, it's very common that they might have a stroke and then that affects their cognition and gives them certain symptoms. And then they might sort of stay at that level for some time. And then they might have another small stroke and they would have more advanced symptoms at that point. So it's kind of a stepwise progression compared to Alzheimer's disease, which tends to be more of a steady progression as symptoms get worse over time. So cognitive changes may not be due to dementia. So I think it's important to say that because as we get older, it is harder to remember things. And I like to think of our brains as being filing cabinets that get more and more filled with memories and facts. And as you know, when you go into a very full filing cabinet, it takes some time to find what you're looking for and pull it out, but you are able to do it. It's still there. So if you're just finding that it takes longer to remember things, or you go into a room and you say, what am I here for? Just know that that may not be dementia. That may be normal changes with aging. And then there are also treatable causes of memory loss and confusion. And here are some of them. Depression, grief, B12 deficiency, an infection, a urinary tract infection is a really common cause of some changes in thinking, dehydration, thyroid imbalance, side effects of medication, especially if you're taking a combination of medications. So the message I want to leave you with is if you're concerned about changes in your thinking or someone else's, talk with a healthcare provider and begin that process of sorting out what could be going on. I want to put this in the context of the, the family and friends circle because it's important to know that Dementia affects the whole circle of people who care, not just the individual living with dementia, and that family and friends need support and information too. And in fact, there is a particular kind of grief, often called ambiguous loss, that comes along with dementia, which it's different than when someone passes away and they're gone and there's a, a particular loss that um, can be very painful. With dementia, the person's there and there is an ongoing relationship. It's just the relationship changes over time. And that adjusting to that change involves grief as well. And it's important for people to know that and to get support in their grief. I want to next just say, as we're talking about the challenges of dementia, that people can and do live well with dementia. Symptoms may be mild for a long time. Again, we were talking about vascular dementia. It's different with every condition. It's different with every person. So for some people, um, things may stay stable for quite a long time, and that may be with mild symptoms. And then no matter what the symptoms are, with some support and adaptation, people may well be able to do what matters to them. So we have to take that mindset of focusing on strengths and looking for ways to have um, to live well with dementia. And that's very possible. And even as symptoms advance, people can still feel good. I spoke with someone a while ago who's living with dementia, who was actually diagnosed in her 50s. And she said, you know, Beth, it doesn't hurt. And when I have my support systems in place, I can have very good days. And that really stayed with me. And I think that's a very important message because there is a lot of fear about dementia. And I think there's less fear when people realize it's possible to continue to live well. 
And just to illustrate that before we jump ahead to memory cafes, I just want to show you some folks. Um, this is Kate Swaffer in Australia, who um, founded the um, Dementia Alliance International and published books after being diagnosed with dementia. Emily Ong, who's an activist in Singapore living with dementia, who is helping to shape the worldwide conversation about dementia. And then these are just some regular folks like you and me who are having a good time at memory cafes. And I love this quote from Sandy Halperin, who is a retired dentist living with dementia, who says, I am eager to see all those living with dementia and their care partners break through the barrier wall of stigma to live the most fulfilling and productive lives. Sandy's point is so important because we don't have a medical cure right now. Certainly the research community is working hard and there have been advances recently, but right now in this moment, we can all help to break down this barrier wall of stigma. And that is um, a, a very important way to help one another um, to live well, even in the presence of dementia. So with all that said, memory cafes are about bringing people together. Um, and so I think from what we've talked about so far, you can see how oftentimes people do become isolated. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of awareness or understanding, and there is a lot of stigma still about dementia. So memory cafes are really aiming to break through that barrier wall and give people places to connect, to have fun, and be together. They are free, friendly gatherings for people living with changes in their thinking due to any medical condition at any stage of progression. When I say progression, it's that all of these conditions that cause dementia tend to get worse over time. So we talk about progressing. Um, so it doesn't matter if someone has just begun to have symptoms, if symptoms are more advanced or even very advanced. People attend memory cafes who aren't able to use language. Um, people attend to use mobility aids. Um, people attend to don't use any kind of assistance and you would not know they had dementia to talk with them. It's for people at any stage. Cafes are also for family, friends, and professional caregivers if someone has one. No one asks participants if they have a diagnosis or what it is. And that's important because it can take time to get a diagnosis. Even when someone's working very hard toward that goal, um, there can be waits to see a specialist. Sometimes the diagnosis is a difficult one because they may have less typical symptoms. It, it really can take quite some time to get a diagnosis in some cases, or some people really feel uncomfortable about seeking that information. And so they may be living with symptoms without having a diagnosis. There are also people who have been diagnosed, but they really don't want to hear about it. They don't want to talk about it. Maybe they just aren't aware that their thinking has changed. So a memory cafe is an open door for all of those folks, as well as for folks who understand and are okay with their diagnosis. All of the above. A cafe is a place to really leave the disease at the door, focus on strengths, focus on our shared humanity, and just enjoy time together. So I'm going to show you a one minute video that will give you images of memory cafes happening in person, virtually, outdoors, indoors, all around Massachusetts. And I hope we'll give you a little bit of a flavor for what they're about. It can be lonely living with memory loss or dementia. But you are not alone. Memory cafes are bringing people affected by dementia together at welcoming social events. It's fun. I am so thankful to have a place where my mom and I can go and laugh and just enjoy the experience. I've made new friends. They understand what I'm going through because they are living it too. Memory cafes encourage me to try different activities, which is really refreshing. You'll find guest artists, musicians and dancers, educational programs, or simply a place to relax and chat with others. These gatherings are free, and you can attend as many as you would like. Cafes are offered weekly or monthly, 
with options to meet in person, online, or even by telephone. Visit these websites to learn more and find a memory cafe near you. So I hope that give you, gave you a little bit of a flavor of what cafes look like in action. And now I just wanna to talk to you a bit more about what we actually do with them. Every cafe is different. It's kind of like your neighborhood coffee shop, at least in the days before Starbucks, when we had a lot more neighborhood coffee shops, they're all different. Some of them are held virtually or in person or kind of a mix. Um, they all have a social component, so time to chat. If they're in person, they just about always have food, um, refreshments of some sort. Some of them offer lunch, which is a really nice perk. And then there's a lot of different things we do. Um, a lot of the things we do have to do with the creative arts because that's a really great way to spend time together, to have enjoyment and challenges that sidesteps language, which can be a very difficult cognitive process for people with more advanced dementia. So music is amazing. It activates all these different areas in our brain. And often a person with very advanced dementia who might not be able to speak very easily can still sing and will remember the words to familiar songs. So singing is a popular activity or any kind of music. Also movement. We all need a little exercise, right? And it's fun. And um, it's another way to, to feel connected to people. So dancing, yoga, um, any kind of movement is very popular art appreciation. So sometimes it's more of an educational activity. Um, sports talk, we at the JFNCS Memory Cafe have had a couple of um, Red Sox sessions. Um, we have a participant who's a longtime umpire, and he really challenged us with questions about, you know, what should the call be if this happens? I mean, it was all totally, um, for me, very, very um, new information, but a lot of our participants got right into it and talked about their favorite players. And, you know, it was, it was very much fun. Um, some cafes will have local history presentations, um, improv or theater games, drumming, storytelling, and more. That's just a flavor. Um, a lot of cafes have volunteers. So you see in this picture, three of our volunteers from Brandeis University. Our cafe has a partnership with a student group at Brandeis. So we've always had students co-host with us every month, which is really fun to have that intergenerational component. And a lot of cafes do something like that as well. But again, the message I wanna give you is that they're all different. So um, if you try one, you don't like it, try another one. And you can go to as many as you want, and they're all going to do different things. So again, just to circle back to the key principles and aims of memory cafes, the focus is social connection. So we definitely do challenging and interesting and fun things, but the goal is not to sing a magnificent um, song together as a chorus or to create you know, a great um, dance performance. It's not about the end product. It's about the process. It's about doing things that will help us get to know each other and enjoy that connection and that time together. And for the people who come with a family member or friend, it's a great way for those folks to have something fun to do. So actually, one thing I want to comment on is a lot of people find that their friendships start to fall away when they have dementia because friends don't know how to stay connected. They want to, but they don't know how to spend time together. So I think memory cafes are a great resource for friends and also for, um, you know, kind of that circle of people who might be close, but not as close. Um, so, you know, other siblings or um, other relatives who are not maybe the primary person who's spending time day, day, um, day to day or living with the person who has dementia. Attending a memory cafe together on a regular basis is a great way to spend time together, keep your relationship strong. It means you don't have to provide the activity, someone else is facilitating it. 
and you can enjoy it. With virtual cafes, you can actually meet up from different parts of the country. We see that happening. We see sometimes several family members meet together on a virtual cafe. And if the person living with dementia needs to be reminded or a little help logging on, sometimes someone will call them on the phone and help guide them through that while they can see each other on screen. So there are lots of creative ways that cafes help with this goal of social connection. Again, cafes are for people living with dementia and those who care about them, and that's a broad category. They're for people with cognitive changes due to any medical cause at any stage of disease progression. No one is asked their diagnosis. You can be at a memory cafe and never talk about dementia, or if you want to talk about it, you can, and sometimes people do. Sometimes people bring it up and, and share about it, and that's absolutely fine too. We follow the lead of the participants. That's that's the goal is to respond to where they're at and what they want to talk about and share. They're tailored to local interests and language and needs. So they are happening in different languages. Um, I know of cafes happening in Spanish, Portuguese, Mandarin, and hopefully over time there will be more and more. And they, you know, vary depending on the location, the setting, their cafes at libraries, at coffee shops, at art centers, at senior centers, um, many different settings. And depending on the setting, it often helps to guide the kinds of activities they do. They're free of charge. Donations are certainly welcome, but you, um, you don't need to worry about cost. So where do you find a memory cafe? And um, here are some links that you could follow to find a memory cafe or more than one. In Massachusetts, my organization, Jewish Family and Children's Service, maintains an online directory of Massachusetts cafes. So it's jfcsboston.org forward slash memory cafe directory. And you can see that video that I showed in English, Spanish, or Portuguese up at the top of that directory as well. There's also a National Memory Cafe directory, which is a simple URL. It's just memorycafedirectory.com. And within that website, you can click on another option, Cafe Connect, to find a list of virtual cafes. And it's nice because those you can participate in from anywhere. I've also put on screen the JFNCS Memory Cafe YouTube playlist. Of course, that's a complicated link to see, um, but you can just go to jfcsboston.org and scroll down to the bottom of that page and you'll see a list of virtual programs. Click on the JFNCS Memory Cafe and you'll get there. But there you can see recordings from many of our previous virtual cafes they're fun to watch and it'll give you a flavor of what we do at a cafe. Um, I also just wanna mention Jewish Family and Children's Service where I work has a number of other wonderful offerings for older adults. Most importantly is our information and referral service because this will get you to any of our other programs. And it's also just a great way to get some advice and to learn about what we have to offer. So it's 1-800-980-1982 or info at cjpseniordirect.org. Everyone is welcome to contact this service, um, families, professionals, it's open to all. We also have a very large care management practice called Your Elder Experts. We have the Charlotte and Richard Acano Parkinson's Family Support Program, which has wonderful arts-based and information and support programs for people living with Parkinson's disease, Schechter Holocaust Services, and more. So that just gives you a flavor of all that we do here in Waltham. I want to now go to your questions and, and really um, zero in on any particular issue that you might want to know more about. Um, before I do that, I'm just going to ask Jessica, um, who has been helping me with our monthly memory cafe, if you want to um, just tell us 
what you've observed about the impact that attending the cafe has on our participants. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Yeah, so I first heard about Memory Cafes years ago when I was living in Florida, and I had heard about the example here in Massachusetts, and I attended a webinar um, for a Massachusetts Memory Cafe, and I was fascinated by the idea. And so who knew all these years later, I'd get to work with you, Beth, and get to be part of these uh, these cafes. And, you know, it looks different now. We are virtual now, um, although I do understand that some places have gone back to in-person which is fabulous. But I think I've been really impressed at how well virtual cafes have worked out. Um, I think they've adapted really well. And I think it's it's just really important in the types of activities and the types of programs that go on at these cafes that we remember and we acknowledge that that everyone is still very capable of doing the same activities. It just takes a little bit of adaption, the same way we would adapt things for anyone, really. Um, and it's not about uh, you don't you don't want to have a, how would I say this? Um, you just want to make sure that it's age appropriate. And I always think if it's something that I would want to do, then it's probably something you know somebody else might want to do, you know, in the adult age range or older adult age or age range. Um, so I just, I, I love seeing everyone interact with each other. Um, certain participants are always, you know, ready to come in with a poem to share, uh, which I think is really cool. People have really taken on a role and are very proud to be part of that, those cafes I've, I've noticed. So yeah, uh, thank you for, for talking about it. <laughs> Thanks, Jessica. You raise such an important point, which is that when a person develops some kind of cognitive impairment, they are still an adult. They are an individual with a lifetime of experiences. And it's very important to understand that it's possible to adapt an activity so that a person can feel successful and enjoy it without making it childish. So I really appreciate your bringing that up. And it is something that we think about a lot at a program like a memory cafe is creative ways to do that. And as you point out, Jessica, there really are um, ways to do that with any activity to make it work for a variety of cognitive needs without um, taking away the fact that this is a room full of adults. And it's all about respect. Debbie, I'm wondering if there's any questions that you'd like us to address or anything you want us to zero in on a bit more? Yeah, that definitely. Um, actually, first, can you, um, is there another slide for a way to reach you or to just want to complete the presentation? Um, so there's just, I have, we have gotten to the end of it, but I will um, I will put in my contact information here. Although it's, well, let's see. I think it's in the previous slide. I just want to make sure people are able to see it. Yeah. Just so when, me... you know, when people, if people need to reach you or have more questions after the program, that'd be great. Yeah. So I'm just putting in okay. my contact information and... Um, Wonderful. our website, our organizational website. And in fact, if they go to the Memory Cafe directory, my contact information is at the bottom of it. So that's probably the easiest way. Okay, there we go. Can you see that? Yes. Yep. Definitely. Okay, great. I'll make sure people um, know how to reach you. Perfect. All right. So um, can you just go back to the origin of Memory Cafe? How, what was the impetus for that? What absolutely needs were there and where did it start? Yeah, it's a great question. So Memory Cafes originate in Leiden, Holland. They were started by a Dutch geriatrician named Bear Meissen. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing his name correctly for anyone who speaks Dutch, but um, he had the idea back, this was in the late 90s, that people would feel more comfortable talking about dementia if there were a social space that was relaxed, informal, even fun, instead of 
treating it as such a serious, scary medical issue. So he started something called an Alzheimer's Cafe in the city of Leiden and actually has a um, neon sign that says Alzheimer's Cafe and really wanted to get people used to saying the word and not be afraid of it. This model spread throughout Europe and it came to the United States. The first cafes in the U.S. were started um, around 2008 in um, Santa Fe and in Roseville, Minnesota. And the people who started cafes found that they made such a difference in people's lives that they became very passionate about sharing the model. So it just kind of spread through the efforts of um, a handful of folks who really wanted this to be available. We here at JFNCS started our cafe in 2014. I mentioned we were the second one. The first cafe in Massachusetts was started in Marlboro at um, the Create a Better Day Cafe at um, the what was then the Pleasant Trees Day program. Now it's called Create a Better Day. And it's still running since 2011 in Marlboro. So um, what was what was wonderful for for us is that when we started our cafe, there was such interest from other providers as well as from community members. Um, and that's how the percolator got started um, initially. It was just a meeting I had of, you know, eight eight people in the area who were curious about memory cafes. And then it just grew and grew and grew because I think what we all found is that it was such a relief for people to have some place to go that was fun, joyful, focused on strengths, something they could do together and really um, have a nice, a nice afternoon or nice morning and to break through that isolation and that stigma. Mm. That's wonderful. Now, since um, since you started the Memory Cafe, how do you know how many Memory Cafes there are now in Massachusetts? Has it grown? Is it in every senior center, or is that the goal? Um, so we at, we hit a height of about 130 cafes before the pandemic, and um, about. 30 closed during the pandemic. Um, unfortunately, the pandemic, of course, has been very tough on any program focusing on getting people together. And for many of the organizations, they needed to pull their staff from a program like a memory cafe and focus them on meeting basic needs during the pandemic. Now, many have reopened since then that had closed and um, many new ones are now opening. So we're we're now back over 100. Um, we're probably at about 102 cafes in Massachusetts. And we have the second most of any state in the United States. Wisconsin has always been just a, a hair ahead of us. Um, and interestingly, in Wisconsin, a lot of their cafes are run through their library networks. Librarians have really been out in front in Wisconsin, as well as some other um, advocacy and nonprofit groups. But, um, you know, I love the idea of them being available at every senior center or in some way being available in every town. And that isn't the case. Um, we have over 350 municipalities in Massachusetts and, and not all of them have a cafe. But um, at least there are cafes in every region, and hopefully there will be more over time. Oh, I hope so. It's it's just um, it's such a wonderful um, philosophy and a way for people like yourself to just gather strength based approach having a lot of socialization, using play, music, art, whatever type of movements just to help people feel feel good about themselves and just to maybe forget about their troubles or feeling isolated. Um, very important. So um, do you, just going back to one of the slides um, that you mentioned, so, uh, you talked about cognitive changes may not be dementia. And what struck me is um, B12 deficiency. 
a vitamin can impact our ability to think and to process and just to have that cognitive, um, you know, flow. Well, why, why do you think is that? What type of research are there, are there that you know of? I, yeah, I, so I'm aware that that can cause changes in cognition. I'm not a doctor, I'm a social worker, so I can't give you too much detail on that. I will say that in general, the diagnostic process involves ruling things out. So if I go to my primary care doctor and say, you know, I'm worried about changes in my memory or changes in my thinking, she will begin that process of looking at what might be going on and ruling things out. So probably a blood test would be one of the first steps and to really look and see if I do have nutritional deficiencies, thyroid imbalance, et cetera. Um, and the good news is if it's something like that, it can be treatable. So that's one of, you know, sometimes people say, well, why even go and get diagnosed when there isn't a cure right now? There's not, you know, a pill you can take to stop Alzheimer's disease, for example. One of the many reasons why it's a good idea to, to, talk to your provider and go through this process is that the cause may be something that is treatable. Um, it's also often really helpful to know what's going on and to be able to have some idea what to expect. It can help very much with problems that could be coming up as a result of changes in thinking. Uh, you know, I think it's always important to note that cognitive changes aren't something we can see with our eyes. You know, it's not like if someone has a broken leg and they have a cast and crutches and you can see it on x-ray and it's more or less obvious what happened and, and what their needs are. Um, dementia is invisible to us just looking at a person. And so if somebody's having, um, you know, if they're having forgetfulness, if they're having changes in mood or irritability, if they're having um, hallucinations, if they're losing things and then trying to understand what happened by perhaps accusing someone else of having taken or moved their item, all these are things that can come up that can cause a lot of tension among people who care about each other. So sometimes getting a diagnosis can be very helpful because then everyone understands it's not this person's fault. They're not doing it on purpose. And again, if it is a nutritional deficiency or one of those other issues that I listed, then there can be treatments to help it. Very good point. Very good point. And can I also add sure. something to that? Um, there are some things that just happen to our bodies that will not affect us the same way that it will affect an older adult uh, just because of their age. So maybe, and I, I don't know too much research on the B12 deficiency, but in me, that might not cause the same symptoms the way that a UTI would not cause the same symptoms as well. So that's another, just wanted to also include that. Yeah, um, I appreciate that. Yeah. I, I remember when I used to um, do bedside nursing, um, taking care of patients, uh, and I used to do um, a day evening shift. So evening shifts. Sometimes when I would get um, take care of a patient uh, who has an underlying diagnosis of dementia, and they come in with a urinary tract infection, I just from years of experience, we call it sundowning. When the sun goes down, that's when their dementia, it seems, becomes more heightened and they become more confused. And so that's where, you know, fall risk and safety becomes, you know, a big issue, at, you know, especially in the hospital, just to make sure that the patient themselves are, are um, safe and they feel safe. Um, so, you know, definitely, a you know, a, a concern there for um, patients with a urinary tract infection. Can you Absolutely. Just, yeah. So Beth, you talked about ambiguous grief. Mm -hmm. My ears perked up because ambiguous grief, it makes really, it makes so much sense. And then it made me realize there must be different types of griefs out there, right? So can yeah. you talk a little bit about ambiguous grief and how, um, how caregivers can be supported in along that journey? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think 
I think grief is um, a very, very important um, part of a human being's life. It's, I always say it's the price of love. You know, when we lose something precious to us, whether it's a relationship in a particular way or a person or um, a job, any number of things, a sense of identity that we had at one point, you know, we grieve and it's a physiological process. It, it affects us. It, may, it takes energy, it can make us very tired. It can make us forgetful. Um, but it's something we don't often recognize and kind of make space for in our daily lives. So the concept of ambiguous loss was pioneered by a psychologist named Pauline Boss. Her last name is B-O-S-S. And she has some wonderful books and podcasts and videos that your audience could look up. She has a book I often recommend called Loving Someone Who Has Dementia. And it really talks about this issue of ambiguous loss, that it's it's a different kind of flavor of grief than when someone dies, because when someone's living with dementia, they are very much alive. The relationship is very much continuing. It's just changing. And it doesn't change just once because dementia does progress. So... There's a process of adaptation that may have to happen again and again. And to respond to your question of how to support people, I think the first step is just recognizing it. And um, so I, with one of our care managers, I lead a support group for adults who have a parent or parents living with dementia. And we've been running this group for about nine years um, so there's so many people that we've had the privilege of working with. And we we poll them every year to ask them for feedback and what about the group is most important to them. And what we hear again and again, it's so important to them just to know they're not alone. So I think when someone is feeling grief, it's just very helpful to know, to be, to be, um, given the information and awareness that this is a normal response, it's not something wrong with them, and they are okay, they're going to be okay, and they need to make space for it in their life. They need to um, understand that it's taking energy, and they may need to rest more, they may need to tend to themselves in small ways, like Make sure they stay hydrated, they're getting good nutrition, they're getting walks or whatever it is that helps them feel okay. Those kinds of things are going to be more important. Um, also, Pauline Boss suggests that ambiguous loss really calls on us to accept um, the nuances of life in a different way. So that might mean understanding that we can feel two things at once. For example, someone might feel, you know, I I want my mother to live as long as possible, and I wish that this process would end and that she would be released from it. So someone might feel both those things at once, and that's okay. And what I have found over the years, particularly in this group, is that often just giving people that language so that they understand that this complex thing they're feeling is normal and they're not alone is a relief. We can't really, you know, we can't cure um, grief because again, it's the price of caring. It's the price of being attached to things and people, but we can acknowledge it. We can offer each other comfort. And the same goes for the person living with dementia because they may go through grief as well about adapting to changes they're confronting with. Sometimes a person is working, um, they may be employed, they may be volunteer, depending on their age, they may occupy certain roles that they're going to have to give up or change. Um, and maybe just their concept of their future looking a certain way is something where they're going to have to adapt their idea. And that can bring grief with it as well. 
Jessica, is there anything you want to add? Just that I am writing my paper currently on non-death loss. And so I just love how everything always lines up. <laughs> um, so I am actually doing a lot of reading right now on ambiguous grief and the loss of uh, when, a di when a family member is diagnosed and having to and also at the same time, somebody having to step up into that role of caregiver and just how complex that is. And um, so I'm still in the middle of researching, but <laughs> but know that, yeah, everything. I agree with everything that Beth said and um, was just reading recently about Pauline Boss. So, Wow. It's just uh, I'm going to have to keep sitting with that concept of ambiguous loss or ambiguous grief. I, I just at, at I have um, elderly parents who are, thank God, still with us. But um, I feel like ambiguous loss or grief can be applied to different areas in our lives. So, mm -hmm. you know, knowing that my parents are here still, but, you know, worrying about, you know, when they pass, it's just that, you know, there's that duality, you know. Yeah grateful that they're here, knowing what's going to happen. But then at the same time, knowing that, you know, every day is going to be different. And who knows, maybe I'm the one that's going to go first, <laughs> not them. So it's just, um, like you said, a lot of complex emotions. And to have a space to unpack these emotions um, and also, you know, from what I'm hearing, um, also applying the practice of self-compassion, knowing that it's okay not to be okay and to be mindful of when you're feeling sad or just feeling isolated or feeling like you're the only one and just offering yourself that self-kindness, um, I'm sure goes a long way with this type of, um, you know, process. Absolutely. Yeah. We talk about self-compassion a lot in our support group and we do certain exercises for example um, there's a wonderful exercise that a psychologist named Kristen Neff um, has on her website selfcompassion.org um, where you write yourself a letter but you write it as if you're writing to a dear friend and in that letter, you talk about a challenge you're dealing with. So we suggest that our participants write a letter focusing on one of the challenges they're feeling as they care for their parent or parents living with dementia, but write it to themselves as if they were writing to a dear friend. And the reason for that is we often are able to summon up a lot more compassion for other people than we are for ourselves. So I think that's... Um, a good thing to be aware of and the nature of caring for someone living with a chronic condition, whatever that may be, is that it's so easy to always feel that you're never good enough um, because you can't eradicate that condition that's causing the symptoms. And, you know, we always sort of want to do that. If only I could say the right thing, do the right thing, find the right doctor, you know, put together the perfect plan for the day, somehow I could make it all work. And, and so it is so important to be compassionate toward oneself and um, understand that we have to, um, we have to live with the reality of dementia. And that's really what, you know, Jessica and I um, are all about in our work is supporting people in living well with dementia. Mm -hmm. Are you finding that the rates of dementia is declining or is it going up? And how, what does it look like for people um, post COVID who are concerned about the foggy brain? Would they, mm -hmm. you think they'll be at high risk? for having some sort of symptoms like dementia in the future? Or is it, I'm sure it's too early to tell, but I'm just trying to put connect the dots. Yeah, I think there's a lot of different trends um, that are worth noting. And I can tell you sort of in broad strokes. Um, so a number of large 
scale studies have shown that overall, the risk of developing dementia is going down slightly for some parts of the population, um, which is a good sign. And it, it connects with other research underway that really focuses on what we call modifiable risk factors. So we've learned that a lot of cases of dementia can be delayed or prevented if people are able to do certain healthy things um, over a period of years. For example, exercise is probably number one, um, eating a healthy diet. So whatever's good for your heart is good for your brain. Keeping diabetes, heart disease under control, um, higher educational attainment seems to be associated with lower risk. Um, Treating sensory impairments, so if someone has hearing loss, vision loss, getting some help and support with those, and likewise, treating mental health needs, um, depression, anxiety, getting some help rather than letting those just continue untreated for a long period of time so that we're not exposing our bodies to those high levels of stress hormones over time, um, getting enough sleep. So it seems like as a society, we um, have had more luck implementing those kinds of healthy behaviors generation by generation. Um, and that's paying off in terms of the risk of dementia. That said, there are very significant disparities among different population groups. So African Americans have about twice the risk of developing dementia relative to white Americans. Latino or Hispanic Americans, depending on the study, they look at different groups, seem to have about one and a half times the risk relative to white Americans. And those disparities have not gotten smaller, which is a terrible thing. So there's a lot of work being done as well to try to address the roots of these disparities. It's not about the genetics of these populations. It's about the... Um, other factors, um, which, you know, it's, it's very much an active area of research right now, but it may have at least something to do with the conditions in which they, people grow up and to what extent they have the opportunity to do these healthy things. And it may also have to do with the level of stress that people experience related to racism and discrimination. Um, and there's, Lots of studies looking at other population groups, um, other racial and ethnic groups, um, the LGBTQIA plus community also has a higher risk of dementia relative to cisgender um, heterosexual folks. Um, and there's a lot we just don't know yet. There's a lot of communities where there hasn't been that research participation to really tell us. Wow. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, I know that's a mouthful, but you but know, I think it, it's just it, uh, what I think about is epigenetics, you know, mm -hmm. so the environment that one lives in and access and their ability to feel safe and, you know, the ability to go out in their community and just, you know, just go out and walk and feel safe and have access and uh, be a feel like they're a part of something um, good. Um, so, you know, those are what I got from what you just shared, because it's just so fascinating. I didn't realize that certain groups um, had higher numbers of um, dementia. So hopefully, you know, for those groups, um, memory cafes, at least, are available uh, for them to to help themselves, help the people living with it and also their caregivers, just to kind of give them more of an outlet to help them feel okay um, with what's going on. Well, I think that that, if I could wave a magic wand, that would be the first wish that I would make is for memory cafes to be more available in what we might call underserved communities, because those are communities where it's been harder for them to sustain programs through the pandemic, um, because these are communities that have been under stress in so many ways. So um, definitely there's a lot more need. And I will just say a couple of other quick points. One is that 
a person's individual risk is not necessarily the same as their group risk. So if you've been listening to this and you've heard me mention um, racial or ethnic groups or also women have higher risk than men, um, if you're part of one of those demographics, it doesn't mean your individual risk is higher because your own health behaviors, your own family history might be different than that. So these are patterns that we only see when we look at large, large groups of people and kind of average their experience together. Um, so I think that's important to note. Mm, thank you. Well, we only have a minute or two left. Um, is there... Um one key message, Beth, that you want to share with the, the the viewers just to kind of, you know, allow them to to know what a memory cafe is and how they can, if they want to maybe form one in their community. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the key message is that being together is one of our essential nutrients as human beings. Um, some people are real outgoing and love being with people and some people are not and that's their personality and that's fine. But isolation, when it's isolation, um, that is really hard on, on any human being. So we want to break through that isolation. Memory cafes are really um, easy places to just come check out and try it. So I would ask your viewers to think about anybody in their life who might benefit from checking out a memory cafe and make a commitment to look at the directory and try it and, and go with that person. Um, if you want to start your own, we have free toolkits to help you do that. There's a whole lot of information and support. Come to the jfcsboston.org website, um, contact me, and we'll get you going. And thank you so much for this opportunity to share about memory cafes. Oh, thank you so much, Beth. Jessica, is there one one key message you wanna you wanna hone in before we uh, close out this uh, program for today? Um, it's I mean it's a beautiful opportunity for social connection and just sharing the word, spreading the word about these memory cafes. I mean it's get it out to everyone right so that way we all know that it's there when we need it definitely thank you well i want to thank you beth for being on the program today and learned so much about memory cafe i've, I've you know I, I do a lot of programs in uh, fall prevention programs in different senior centers and from time to time i would hear memory cafe and you know it would intrigue me until recently somebody said oh i'm going to the memory cafe and I asked what that was and they explained it to me. So I wanted to learn more. And that's why Beth, I had you on. Um, so I really, really appreciate your time and sharing your knowledge about Memory Cafe. And uh, I hope more and more will pop up as a result of this program and all your great work. So thank you so much. And I want to thank the Quincy Health Department for our continued um, partnership to um, offer the Aging Strong program out there in the community. So until then, take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you.